Good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. I'm glad that we're here together. Um, I want to pray before I go any further. If you're visiting with us, thank you for being here. We're glad that you're here this morning. It's an honor and a privilege to have you. Pray with me, would you? Father, I pray for clarity. Lord, we gather in this place to honor you. Jesus, you, you said, where two or three are gathered, you're among us. Your word says that if, if you, the Christ, be lifted up, you'll draw all people unto yourself. We're here as your, as your church to lift you up and to say that you are good. Even when life is hard, you are good. You're always good. So Lord, would you direct our steps as we are together this day, in this time, in this ordained time in history that we'll never get back. Would you speak with your truth to our hearts that we would grow to be fully mature and complete, not lacking anything that you have for us. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, let me tell you about a miracle that happened this week. How many of you still believe in miracles? Anybody? Hey, that's a pretty good crowd. Good percentage. Uh, many of you know uh, Myra and Dennis Kaplinger and Kim and Dave Mahaney. And Dennis, on Sunday last week, a week ago today, um, he had a heart attack. And by the time the, the squad got there, they, they had to bring him back with the paddles. They had to do that four times, where he, they lost him four different times before they were able to, to get him into the, uh, into the cath lab, where he had a 100% blockage. They put in several stents, but he had what, was, what would have been called the widow-maker blockage, right? Pretty incredible. Uh, when I got to speak with Dennis yesterday and to hear Dennis saying, tell everybody thank you for praying for me. Amen. Prayer changes things. Yeah, it's really... As a pastor, one of the things that, that you, you appreciate is when medical professionals say things like this, it took a miracle. And you're the evidence of a miracle. I always appreciate that. Uh, so thank you on behalf of Dennis. Thank you for, for being the body that, that uh, leans in on behalf of each other as a part of the family. We're starting a series this morning entitled Comparison Trap. Um, does anybody ever fall into a comparison trap? Anybody? I mean, am I the only one? No? Some of you too? Thank you for being honest. Um, you, you know, many of you know I ride a motorcycle. It's a, it's a Harley Actually, she. She has a name. Her name's Rhoda. Uh, you can laugh if you want to, but, you know, if you're going to have a bike and, and you like it, you should name it. That's just the way it works. Uh, I don't know about you, but there's all sorts of things that can lead me down Comparison Road, that, that lead me to be stuck in Comparison Roundabout. How about you? It, it doesn't take a lot for me to begin to wonder... Why somebody has something that I don't have. And when, when wonder turns to envy, danger is around the corner. That's right. right? And so I was sitting uh, at a table with a friend from Sioux Falls, South Dakota this week. And, and we, were, we were just talking about some things and we both ride and... And he said, hey, let me show you what I'm picking up when I get home on Saturday. And he flips out his phone and, and flips over to this. Now, now Rhoda is a 
2002 1200 Harley that was gifted to me in 2006. A, a generous gift that I was gracious and grateful to receive. I've put a lot of miles and memories on her and we, we enjoy that every time we get the opportunity. Until I see somebody else's bike like <laughs> Carmen's. He starts flipping over and he shows me this. Now for people who ride, you'll get this. It's an Indian Chieftain 2015 edition. All the bags and bells, right? I mean, this thing is sweet. If I were going to lead Harley, it would be for an Indian, right? I mean, that's the upgrade in my eyes. It's this deal. Uh, it's a touring edition, right? Every, about 99 miles, and I'm looking for a gas station. They can get about 300 miles, right? It's just that kind of bike. And all of a sudden, as I'm looking at, at his beautiful, bountiful blessing that he's telling me about the incredible deal he received, which it was an incredible deal, all of a sudden, I'm not as grateful for Rhoda as I was before. <laughs> Anybody ever have that problem? Right? Because we fall into the comparison trap of life. We, we forget how blessed we are because we begin comparing our lives to other people's blessings. Amen. Or the perception of yeah. what we think they're blessed with. Right? Right? So all of a sudden, we, we allow our vision to be clouded and our minds to be, to be changed and our hearts to be modified, and we begin, if we're not careful, to become bitter. Yes. See, when I live my life in comparison to other people, there's only one, or two, one of two things that will emerge from the comparison trap. I will either feel superior to people, which is pride, or I'll feel inferior to people, which is envy, yes. both of which aren't good. Yes. Right? The, the, the Bible would call both of them mistakes. Mistakes. The Bible would call both of them things that aren't, aren't profitable for us. See, most everyone who, who gives into the comparison trap, we, we, we don't normally settle into long-term superiority because we begin to realize that there's always somebody with more, yes. right? Everybody at some point when you allow yourself to go down the comparison road and get stuck in comparison roundabout, you live in envy more than superiority, right? You live in inferiority instead of superiority. And then we begin to make a lot of decisions that are unprofitable for our life, don't we? And the Bible has a lot to say about this comparison trap. The Bible has a lot of instruction. This is, this is pretty important to God on our behalf. If you don't remember anything else I say, I hope you'll remember this because I believe it to be absolutely true. Living by comparison dishonors God and steals my joy. Amen. When I live my life by comparison, living by comparison dishonors God it's as if we're saying to God, you haven't blessed me enough. That's right. You've not done enough for me, right? Amen. Have you ever watched your kids on Christmas Day open things and be ungrateful all within 20 minutes? <laughs> Doesn't that just feel great? I wonder if God sometimes feels that way when we allow ourselves to live in, in the comparison trap. If you brought your Bible, you can turn to Exodus chapter 20. It'll be on the screens for you. Verse 17, it, it's the last of the, it's the tenth of the Ten Commandments. It elaborates more than the other commandments, by and large. And it says this, you shall not covet. You shall not covet. It doesn't say, I looked, it doesn't say it'd be a good idea not to. It doesn't say you shouldn't. It says, don't do it. You shall not covet. Would you say the word covet? covet. The word covet, is, it's translated in the New Testament as greed most often, or envy. You shall not covet 
Don't covet. Don't be envious. Don't allow a bitter root to grow up in your heart. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. That's a pretty broad topic. Your neighbor's stuff. You shall not covet your neighbor's stuff. Your neighbor's wife. That's a good idea not to covet. His manservant or maidservant. His employees. His ox or donkey. Or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You shall not covet. The, the, the Bible's saying, listen, God's saying this. It's a really bad idea for you to do this because it will only lead you to places you don't want to stay. And it'll it'll lead you to places where you'll start to make trades that will change the operating system of your life. And you'll start building apps on top of a new system that are unprofitable for your life. Right? Don't do it. Don't allow coveting to become the baseline of your living. Don't do it. Here's a working definition for the word coveting. Strongly desiring that which belongs to someone else. Strongly desiring that which belongs to someone else. See, coveting is really this. It's greed and envy wearing the same mask. Coveting is it's greed and envy wearing a mask. And we, and we try to act like it's no big deal. Robert Morris says this, coveting at its highest level is a raised fist in the face of God. That's interesting. I think it's accurate. Luke chapter 12, verse 15 says, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Would you say the word greed? greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You know, how many of you believe that? I mean, for real, let's just think that through for a minute. How many of you believe that our life doesn't consist in the abundance of our possessions? The Bible says it. I mean, these are Jesus' words. A man's life doesn't consist. It's not comprised of. Its its essence isn't found in the abundance of our possessions. But you know what we're really good at? Accumulating abundance. And basing our life on our possessions. Aren't we? Right? We, we, my, my stepfather used to say, be careful if you get your water going. And I'm like, what? He had all kinds of tailspun wisdom, but this was one of them. He'd say, you get your water going, next thing you're going to do is get a different job so you can have more stuff. Yeah, I guess you're right. Last time we were in Guatemala, we were, uh, I was talking with Manny, the missionary, and, and he was speaking about uh, one of the gentlemen who worked for him, Baldilio. Baldilio is, uh, is the guy that really does all the behind-the-scenes stuff to make sure so many things function in the mission for all the, all the churches they're invested in and the projects that they do. He fabricates all the metal trust systems for all the churches they build and in buildings that they've constructed. And, and Manny was saying that he put, he had given Baldilio a raise, but didn't tell him about it and put extra in his check, in his, in his paycheck. And Baldilio came with the, with the extra and gave it back to Manny and said, you, you made a mistake. And Manny said, no, I didn't make a mistake. You, you've earned this. You're worth this to us. We, we so love you and appreciate you. And, and Baldilio with, with tears in his eyes, said, I can't accept that. And Manny said, why, why can't you accept that? And he said, I can't accept it because the more I have, the more I'll want. And the more I want will lead to greed. And I thought, my goodness gracious, how absolutely backward is that kind of thinking in a North American mindset? It, it just swims upstream. And I mean, Baudilio works really hard. He's a truly hard worker and a great man. But, but his perspective was he didn't want greed to take root in his heart. And, and he understood what Jesus was saying, that you know, the, the essence of my life isn't found in my things, it's found in my relationships. 
right? True, true wealth is found in relationships, not in possessions. Yes. I've known a lot of people who make unwise financial choices because they choose to live in the comparison trap of greed. How about you? Have you ever, how many of you have known people that make really dumb choices when it comes to money because they live by comparison, right? We know them. We've seen it. How many of you know them because you've seen them in the mirror? Yeah, me too. Me too. I've known people who, who buy houses that they can't afford to keep an image that they, 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 they can't you know, continue to maintain. I've been in homes that look like McMansions on the outside and have lawn furniture on the inside because they can't afford to put furniture in the house that they can't afford to pay for. And it's truly tragic because they've become a slave to a perception to try to paint it for other people. And so they own a home that they would never invite people into, right? Right? I've watched people make unwise investments in vehicles over and over again because they, they live by comparison. There's an image that they're trying to maintain. And, and if, you're, if your sense of self-worth is based on the accumulation of things, your self-worth is always in jeopardy. Amen. Hallelujah. Right? If you're living by the comparison of, of how you feel about yourself being based on the things around you or that you have. And truly, if, if you're in the comparison trap, you don't have things, things have you. And your self-worth is always in jeopardy. Living by comparison dishonors God and steals my joy. When we choose to live by comparison, really what we're doing is we're, we're nurturing bitter roots in our life. See, why would, why would God paint this all the way back in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue of, of when he said, look, get it right for the people. Help them to know, Moses, this is what I want you to, to, to make sure and instill in the generations that come forever and ever from this, this nation that I'm making my own. Make sure they get this one. These are the ten, and, and he puts it right in the list. Why would he go all the way uh, to, that, to that extent to say, don't covet if it wasn't good advice? Yes. Because God understands the heart of mankind. And he understands the schemes of the enemy. And God has a plan for you. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he planned in advance for us to do. And, and God knows that the enemy wants to keep us from doing just that. God knows, the, the Father knows, the Creator knows, that we, the created, are going to live in this polarization of tug-of-war between being satisfied in who he is and who he's made us to be and the desire for more all the time. This comparison goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. You know, it's how the enemy yes. tricked Adam and Eve into eating the apple. They, he, he got them to compare themselves to God, right? If you go all the way back and read it, they compared. He said, don't you want to know what God knows? Don't you want to be like God? Yes. Eat this fruit and you'll be able to be like God. It was a comparison trap. God put it in the Decalogue, in the Ten Commandments, so we wouldn't miss it in understanding that God's desire for us is to live as free people dependent on Him through a life of surrender. Amen. Not dependent on stuff through a life of addiction. Yes. Right? So he put, it, he put it in Exodus. He says it over and over again. I've limited the scriptures that I'm using, but we, we just looked at Luke 12, 15. If you 
have your Bible or your smartphone, you can turn to Hebrews 12, 15, and it says this. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See to it that nobody misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to defile, to pollute many. How do we, how do we end up having bitter roots? We, we begin nurturing bitter roots when we get our eyes off Jesus. When we as believers get our eyes off of God and get our eyes onto things, bitter roots are planted in our heart. And if we don't eradicate the bitter roots, they will become extravagant weeds that take over where they were never intended to be planted. Yes. How many of you have ever known a bitter person? Man, so how many of you need more coffee? <laughs> Roll those carts back out, please. Now listen, how many of you have ever known a bitter person? You know the person who looks like they just drank a cup of vinegar, Right? The person who looks like they were baptized in prune juice. The person who looks like, you know, they've been going to church so long that they can't stand anybody. Right? Have we known any of those people? Now, how many of you have known a joyful person? Yeah? You know, I've known both, and I've never known them to be the same person. You will never know a bitter person who is truly joyful. And you'll never know a truly joyful person who is, who is truly bitter. They don't coexist. It's oil and water. You cannot be bitter and filled with joy. Amen. See, you can be bitter and be temporarily happy, but happiness is an emotion based on your feelings, and your feelings are based on your thoughts. So you can be bitter and happy, but you cannot be bitter and joyful at the same time. See, bitter roots of comparison produce bad fruit in our lives. They produce resentment. And they, they lead us to resent other people. Right? This is how you know you resent somebody. You resent somebody if when bad things happen to them, you, are, you celebrate. Right? You resent somebody. If something bad happens to them and you celebrate, you've got a bitter root issue in your life. And, and we would never admit it in church. I mean, that'd be super awkward. It'd be automatic altar call. <laughs> We'd sing lots of verses of Kumbaya and Just As I Am and wait around for things to happen spiritually, which we probably should. But when we, when we have bitter roots in our lives, it leads us to resent other people. So their blessings, and it starts like this, we watch them and everything good seems to happen for them. They, they have all the things we wish we had. And then we, we secretly begin to, to hope that they don't keep having good things happen to them. And we think that somehow God loves them more than He loves us. And we believe that God must not like us compared to them. And we begin comparing ourselves instead of to Jesus, who's the standard, we begin comparing ourselves laterally to somebody else. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. It's not for me to decide who gets blessings. It's not for me to decide who gets, who gets to, to live in in abundance, it's for me to decide whether or not I'm going to follow Jesus. Whether or not I'm going to be God's person or I'm going to keep trying to make God my person. The comparison trap will lead you to some messed up things. And, and if, you, if you're at that place in your life where you're resenting other people because good things keep happening to them, the problem's not with them. I mean, they probably have problems, but the problem isn't with them. It's with me. It's with me. It's my heart issue that's the problem. There was a guy who found a corked bottle on the ocean uh, shore, and 
And he took the cork out and a genie popped out. And the genie said, hey, uh, you get three wishes, but be careful because your enemy gets twice of anything you wish for. And so the guy said, well, I want a million dollars. And at his feet were a million dollars. And simultaneously at the feet of his enemy were two million dollars. And the genie said, well, I just want you to know your enemy's twice as rich as you now. And he said, well, I want the largest diamond in the world. And simultaneously, the, his enemy got two of the largest diamonds in the world. And, she, and the genie said, I just, just be aware, he's still outpacing you by double in wealth. And the guy was really angry. And so he thought about it, and he thought about it. And he said, I want you to scare me half to death. <laughs> That's true resentment. <laughs> When we nurture bitter roots, it leads us to resent ourselves. See, when we get stuck in the comparison trap and the bitter root takes hold, it it makes us begin to resent who we are. And we start start thinking, "I, I I must not work hard enough. And so we start making trades with our time. We can't get back this side of eternity. Time's the one thing that once you spend it, you never get it back. Once you use it, it never returns. And when we, when we allow that bitter root to take hold and we begin resenting ourselves, it attacks our self-worth, our self-value. The enemy starts to take, take pot shots at us all the time and we begin to devalue what God has called beautiful. We begin to devalue what God has called worth dying for. We begin to to hate and resent the person that God has said, love yourself so much that you will love your neighbor like you love yourself. You know what it doesn't say? Resent your neighbor like you resent yourself in the great commandment. It says love your neighbor like you love yourself. And if we allow bitter roots to take, take place in our heart and to grow deep, all of a sudden I can't love my neighbor because I can't love me. Right? We begin by the comparison trap living in this, this isolation mentality that there's something that, that is wrong with me and we begin self-loathing instead of self-loving. And I think self-loving is a healthy thing when we're in alignment with, with who God has made us to be through Him. Yes. There's a lot of people, you've heard me say this before probably, there's a lot of people that I don't want them to love me like they love themselves. Because they don't love themselves. I want them to love me more than they love themselves so that they don't treat me as mean as they are to themselves. Right? right? The walking wounded. The third thing is when we, when we nurture a bitter root, it makes us resent God. And when we start resenting God, we're in dangerous territory. Yes. See, when I live in the comparison trap, I begin to believe that God isn't just. And that he only is unfair. Now, fair died in the Garden of Eden. Fair is an illusion. It's a fairy tale. It only works out in Disney movies. Life feels a little more like a Jason Bourne movie to me. We we start to resent God and we, we begin to believe wrong things about his character. We begin to believe that God isn't good. We begin to believe that God isn't loving. We begin to believe that God isn't grace-filled. We begin to believe that God is small. Yes. Right? We believe He's small. And that, that, that He treats us unfairly. And that by some twisted sense of entitlement that God should be living to serve us. When He died to serve right? He didn't die so we could accumulate a bunch of garbage that leads us further away from him. He died so that we could be like him, right? So don't buy into the comparison trap. Don't allow yourself to buy the lie that what somebody else has will make your life better. 
Don't allow it to happen. Don't allow it to happen. The day that you want less, you'll have more. Right? The day that you want less, you'll have more. I'm not talking about more stuff. You'll have more joy. You'll have more fulfillment. You'll have more margin. You'll have more life the day that you want less. The day that you want more, you will continue to have less. It's the way it goes. You know, Howard Hughes was a very, very interesting man. Howard Hughes had presidents operating like puppets. At the time that he was alive, he was the wealthiest man. He was eccentric. My goodness, was he eccentric. He, he, he developed an airplane that was larger than any other airplane. He was known for all his huge feats of industry. He viewed people as pawns. He accumulated and amassed incredible wealth. And he died with blackened teeth, curled fingernails, gnarly hair, sunk-in chest, collapsed-in facial structure, wouldn't let anybody around him, and nobody really wanted to be around him. He died with nothing and with no one, but he had everything. He had everything. And yet he had nothing. I don't want to live in the comparison trap. I do not want to live in the comparison trap. And you know what? I'm tempted by it all the time. When I see somebody, some dude with really cool hair, like an afro, (laughs) tempted. This week, I I was honored to be asked to to go out to California. We... I wasn't even going to mention any of this, but the long and short of it, uh, Melissa and I were asked to go out to California. We were with Saddleback Church, Rick Warren and his staff, and they invited 100 pastors from around the world. There were 30, 30 or 32 nations represented, pastors from parts of the world that were absolutely heart-wrenching stories, uh, pastors where ISIS is, is killing people, taking off their heads. And we heard firsthand accounts of stories of things, atrocities that are happening. You know what? This is what I, I'll tell you I find interesting. When ISIS comes and they, and they want to kill somebody, you know, here's what they do. They don't say, hey, are you a Nazarene? Are you a Baptist? Are you Catholic? They say, do you love Jesus? Yeah. Anyway. I met a pastor from the Ukraine, he's, he's 10 kilometers, which is six miles from the line where all the fighting is happening and the resistance is happening against Russia trying, you, do you know the struggle in the Ukraine? I've got a few friends that are missionaries there. The struggle is very real. His church is six miles from that line. Anyway, Met incredible people, again, from all over the place. And, and, and we, were, we were invited there because they wanted to recognize our church as being a church that is, that is healthy and, and is operating with purpose uh, to try to fulfill the great commandment, the great commission. And, and it, was, it was nice. It was really nice to spend time with, with them and to be um, invested into but you know what I found, Melissa, and I, we haven't even spoke about this. They gave us, they gave us these plaques, and there were, there were different medallions, five, that you could receive. Some people got all five. Some pastors were given four. They all represented something else on this journey, okay? Um, and uh, they, gave, they gave us our plaque, and, and ours had three medallions. We're, we're about three years into this journey. Of, of being a purpose-driven church. We've always operated with purpose, but it's really trying to make disciples on purpose. You guys know the process we're in, right? 
the life point process. It's all kind of tied to that. And you know what I began to think when I watched other pastors going up and getting their, their plaques? I, I started comparing myself. I start, and pastors are really bad for this, by the way. And, and, and I, when Rick was teaching, so I started thinking, man, I wish I could teach like Rick. And you know what the Holy Spirit told me? What is wrong with you? What on earth is wrong with you? I've called you to be you. Amen. And I've called him to be him. And you follow me. God. Don't live in the comparison trap. Amen. Don't live in the comparison trap. You know, I, I, don't, I don't ever want you to think I'm perfect. I just want you to know I'm human. I want you to know I struggle like we all struggle. And the Bible is true. And this word is good. And if we allow our lives to be overrun by covetousness, pretty soon we have no ability to be appreciative. Because all the things that we thought were of value, and which truly are, we begin to minimize their worth. And we minimize their worth by constantly wanting more. And never being grateful for what we have. And I hope you won't allow the enemy to continue to spin you out in the comparison trap. I don't want to. So what do we do? I mean, how many of you here struggle with that? Right? If you have a pulse, there's a chance. If you're on social media, there's a highly elevated chance. We begin comparing our lives to somebody else's cropped image. We begin comparing our lives to somebody else's photoshopped life. We begin comparing our morning, our morning face to somebody else's 85 selfies that they pick the perfect one to post. You know, you know there's, a lot of, there's a lot of research on this whole selfie thing. There's a whole lot of research in... And some of the research says for every one selfie you see, there have been 15 pictures taken before they select the one. I don't know how much time it takes to do this. I mean, I'm bad at it. We tried taking a selfie at the beach, and I cut Melissa's head off. I mean, I got her from like right here. I'm like, that's a really bad picture. I mean, the background's awesome until you see her cheekbone. They say that posting a lot of selfies is a sign of mental illness. I know I probably shouldn't say that. But I've read those studies. Anybody else? But you know what happens. Now just follow this for a minute. Follow this for a minute. Somebody who's constantly posting things that are meant to get likes and and all that stuff, they begin judging their worth by how many likes they get, and we begin judging ourselves by their own issue. That's right. That's right? right? Don't live in that trap. Don't live in that trap. I just don't want to live there. And here's the thing, the traps are really subtle. Yes. They're super subtle, aren't they? but they last a lot longer than we'd ever care to stay in them. So if you, like me, have been in a comparison trap, here's how we fix it. First, we apologize to God for fixing our eyes on stuff and people. I, I want God to know that, that He's my priority, and I want God to be my priority. Amen. See, my relationship with, with Melissa and our children is much better when God's my priority. Amen. When I get my eyes off of God as my priority, everything gets a little sideways. Yes. So, if you want to break free of the comparison trap, you begin by having a conversation with God about your, about your situation. Amen. And then asking God... Asking God to give you a new heart and new eyes so that you don't keep operating in the old way. 
God, would you give me a new heart and new eyes so I don't keep doing the same thing? Help me to be wise. Help me to not fall victim to it. Help me to, help me to follow you in it. Amen. David did that in the Psalms. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a pure and steadfast spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Amen. Right? That all came after David allowed coveting to take over his life, which led him to break every one of the Ten Commandments. I don't have time to go into it, but when he broke number 10 by coveting somebody else's wife, it led to murder, it led to false testimony, it led to dishonoring his parents by dishonoring their name, big thing in the Jewish culture. I mean, he broke every one of them because number 10 is the linchpin to all of them staying in harmony. Anyway, how do we break the comparison trap? Apologize to God and ask Him to to change your heart in that area. How many of you feel like we ought to just do that right now? All right, for the seven or eight of us. The rest of you just play along. Let's just pray. Let's just pray together right now. And and you pray right where you are. You don't have to pray after me, but in a moment, I'm just going to give you a few minutes of of silence to, to make that connection with God. Father, in this moment, would you open our eyes? Would you help us to be honest with ourselves and honest with you? Help us to be honest about the things that we live in comparison to. On this Pentecost Sunday, 2016, will you share with us through your Holy Spirit the truth about where we are with you when it comes to this area of our life. Expose to us the lies of the enemy and open our eyes to where we covet. Right now, just pray pray to God. Have have that moment of, of personal reflection and inventory. Father, thank you. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being good. Thank you for being loving. And Lord, thank you for giving us a way out. Your word says that we will never be tempted beyond what we can bear. And and comparison is always a temptation. It doesn't always have to lead to a trap, but it, it will always be a temptation. Help us to be wise to the temptation and to take the escape route. Instead of falling into the trap, help us escape the trap by getting our eyes back on you. Jesus, I pray that you would give us attitudes of gratitude for the things that you've given to us. And Father, some of those things are burdens that are intended to help us grow. Help us to even be grateful when we're walking with burdens that are intended to help us grow. Lord, may we not fall victim to the enemy's lies and the temptations of comparison. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody who prays that, would you say amen? Amen. Amen. Now listen, here's your homework for this week. I heard somebody say, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. I'd like you to take 10 minutes three times this week, right? It's only 30 minutes. And you can spread it out over three 10-minute segments. And I'd like you to take an inventory of the things you're grateful for. Just write them down. Start writing down the things that you're grateful for in your life, the blessings that are a part of your life. Just start writing them down. And maybe it's just start writing down the stuff you're thankful for. Rhoda will be on my list. Write down the things that you're grateful for, stuff you're grateful for. Not necessarily people, but you can put them on the list, but we're going to talk about that more in the coming weeks. But write down, take, take some time to reflect. You know, we don't do that. A lot. I think if we stop to reflect on how awesome God has been to us, we would be less tempted to fall into the trap, right? 
So take some time this week, three times, write it down. I don't care if you write it on, the, on a napkin, but just make the discipline to write it down. Make a, make a list and just keep it tallying up and see what am I really grateful for. Uh, if I were being mean, I'd say, and then pray that God takes away everything that you didn't put on your list. But don't do that. But instead, <laughs> pray and ask God to help you know how to use those blessings to give Him glory. Amen. How to steward those blessings to give, him, to give Him glory and praise. Right? Because our life, everybody says, man, I, I hear people say all the time, I just I want to know God's will for my life. I'm going to tell you what His will is right now. It's for everybody. It's true. His will for your life is this. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. And to love your neighbor like you love yourself. His will for you is to love Him with everything. And so if I honor Him, I honor Him with everything. Right? I want to love Him with everything. And, then I, and that means... If I'm going to love God with everything, I love Him with who I am. And I don't get caught in the comparison trap, and I don't care how cool somebody else's afro is. I'm just grateful I had a razor this morning. Awesome. Listen, remember this, church. Living by comparison dishonors God and steals my joy. Amen? Amen. All right. I think you're up, Corey. Thank you guys for being with us this morning and enjoying um, a good good message. Hopefully we take it beyond just hearing it right here and now into life and allow it to, uh, to truly mold us and shape us. Um, take that homework. Uh, do the homework. And not just this week homework. Make it a life homework exercise that we do. A um, couple of announcements that we have to go over. And some of the things Brad said uh, reflected on some of the things on his sheet for me as a kid. Uh, one, as a kid, we didn't really covet our neighbors because I lived in Section 8 housing and nobody had jack, so you didn't have to covet anything. <laughs> hot dogs and pork and beans are hot dogs and pork and beans. <laughs> but that being said, tonight we have an opportunity where we can help those who don't have, uh, those who don't have a bed, um, those who are sleeping on the ground, um, anyone who's been camping and it's rained, or moisture has gotten in your sleeping bag, or anywhere that you're sleeping, you know what it's like to, to have to deal with the wetness when you're just trying to find any bit of comfort. Tonight, we get a chance to, to be a reaching hand and help individuals um, combat that. We are going to make waterproof sleeping mats for homeless tonight here at the church at 6 p.m. So uh, take an opportunity to come and um, corporately be a reaching hand, connect with others um, that you sit next to on typically Sunday mornings. We can do it now in an evening um, helping people, okay? So we're going to take uh, time and we're going to put together um, waterproof sleeping mats for the homeless. Also, um, I'm going to skip down one. There's a youth summer camp that reflected on me when I was little as well. We went to a summer camp and I think it was a Judge Judy camp and they took all the thugs and, and all the kids that were probably, you know, sent there by the court system. I don't even know why they sent me, you know. <laughs> Our summer camp is not going to be that way. Our summer camp is a Christ-filled summer camp. So if you have kids um, the age 1st through 12th grade, uh, go to lifepoint.cc and take a look at that and, and communicate with your kids and see about signing up for camp. Um, also, uh, don't forget the LifePoint Youth Ministry, L-Y-P-M, L-P-Y-M, LifePoint Youth Ministry. Thanks, Ben. Um, there's the 7th uh, grade, 7th through 12th. Them and their parents uh, tonight from 6 to 8 will be the battle of young versus old. So if you guys have a, a kid to, who is uh, grade 7 through 12 and you kind of want to come show them you still got what you got and maybe feel it the next morning, come on out and um, enjoy the, the young versus old. Um, there's also communication on here about the uh, cardboard box um, adventures that we do every summer that will be held um, three nights this summer. So, again, all this information will be on lifepoint.cc. Uh, you can go there and check it out. Here at LifePoint, we don't pass um, offering plates or collection bags. We do have drop boxes throughout the church. Uh, write prayer request, any new information, write on the card. Um, drop it in the drop box. Drop your tithes and offerings in the drop box. If you're new, never been here before, 
on your way out, swing by the connections desk. Gives a chance to, to get a face-to-face -face hello, meet you. We have a nice t-shirt for you, and we just like to get to know you and start growing with you. You guys enjoy yourselves, love the day, and love each other. Have a great one.